let's take you on a time jump virtual zoom bringing it back to theodore's bedroom these hands are passionately polysyllabic putting the jeopardy theme on swings 10 dons giving predictions balancing vibes like the sons and daughters of ip one ear to the under i want ear to the underground flicking off peppermint fresh experiment let's go el premier elemento you gotta take your time press your fingers to the line red man focus your mind and once you do that you're at the front of the combine Some ideas, they shake you out of your sleep like when a toddler creeps. Totality of the deep, the mere thought of an unconscious manifestation carried out with the beat. Positive charged protons creating neural explosions. Time hiccups when fingers and pads touch. Dead air smiles because it knows what's coming. The counting is of the clock claps hands. The choreography of the knock slaps jams and you be like, who made this? Vertebrae responding to the call so bad they make a bee girl curve the wall. What's going on, world? It's yours truly, Maji Mutafa, Executive Director of Words, Beats, and Life. And I am here on a Friday to build with another one of the Words, Beats, and Life Academy instructors. His name is Max Gibbons. Um, he normally teaches graffiti for us, but this year he's teaching street art. Um, and I'm super excited about the work that he's doing and glad to have him back. He's a current resident of New York City, Brooklyn to be exact. And COVID has provided us with the opportunity to be able to bring him back virtually. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about his practice and a little bit more about the work that he's been doing with young people and maybe even some of the challenges with teaching street art in in a COVID environment. What's going on, Max? Hey, Mazi. Doing well. Uh, can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Thanks. And thanks for the intro. That sums up a lot of things uh, pretty well. So thanks. Appreciate it. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we talk a little bit more about who you are, your practice, how long you've been painting and creating public art? Sure. Uh, so uh, once again, my name is Max Gibbons. Uh, on Instagram, I go by Max Gibbons Lettering. I have been doing graffiti and street art for about 15 years now. I got started when I was in high school, taking the subway, seeing murals and graffiti and street art, and wondering essentially why people do this, uh, how they do it, and why am I not doing it? So I uh, got into graffiti, uh, really interested in uh, the history of tagging, bombing, piecing, everything that goes with that. And then over time, I started to move more towards the street art scene. So uh, thinking about finding legal opportunities to create artwork on walls, uh, during mural jams for businesses, uh, work on canvas as well. And I started to get into uh, calligraphy specifically. So taking the styles and techniques that I was developing through my graffiti practice, and then starting to mix it with traditional um, calligraphy and uh, typography techniques. So combining those two art forms uh, this is something that a lot of artists do, and it really started to gain traction in the late 2000s. Um, this is something that people have been doing for a while, but it started to get more popular. And for me, growing up uh, you know, in a suburban uh, environment in New York, uh, right outside New York City, um, I didn't know a lot of graffiti writers, so I was actually learning a lot from the internet. So a lot of older generations of graffiti writers that have to know somebody in person to teach them. Thankfully, I had the internet. Eventually, I had Instagram and other things, as a lot of people today do as well. And I did have a couple mentors along the way as well, uh, people that put me on and taught me techniques. Uh, but I was able to look at all these different styles and techniques and start to build my own practice, which led to you know creating murals that are you know 30 feet long, 15 feet high, uh, working with a good amount of different artists, making a lot of friends, and obviously working uh, words, Beats, and Life, teaching not only the graffiti class, but more recently, and Mazi was saying uh, earlier in the intro, uh, during COVID, teaching a street art class to students virtually. You know, I'm curious, Max, um, a couple of things. One, I know there's lots of different things that people who paint outside call themselves. Sure. Whether that's writers or graffiti artists or graffiti fine artists and now calligraphy artists. Yeah. Um, what is the power in a name, like this idea of def defining your practice by how you describe yourself? Yeah, totally. I think that's super important. And a lot of graffiti writers consider themselves artists or don't consider themselves artists. Some people consider themselves bombers, where they just go out and they're putting work in the street, they're painting on anything, and they don't care necessarily what other people's perception of them or their artwork is. They're just doing it because that's what they want to do, that's what they love, and they want to uh, you know, put their artwork out into the world. So to your point of, uh, you know, what do artists call themselves? I do think there is some 
standardization. Uh, graffiti is inherently illegal. You can be a graffiti artist or you can do graffiti inspired artwork that is legal, but that doesn't make you graffiti writer necessarily. So I do think there is something inherently illegal or illicit in graffiti writing. Um, and when you take that out of that realm where there is danger, whether to your life, because you could you know, get hit by a train or fall off a building, uh, danger to your property where you could get arrested and have to pay fines and for a lawyer and, and, and you know, pay for all the other things that come with doing an illegal act, um, which I also think is probably the most pure artwork because you know, there is often no monetary gain, right? You're just doing it because you love putting your artwork out into the world, whether that is tagging or piecing or creating murals. Um, so, so I think graffiti writing is, is rooted in that uh, illegitimacy, if you will, uh, of the public. Um, when you're a street artist, you can also be doing illegal artwork, but it's less frowned upon necessarily. Uh, and it's often, and not necessarily always, but it's often less quote unquote destructive. You may be using uh, a wheat paste, right? So a poster that could be taken down or a sticker that could easily removable compared to, you know, the etch bath that someone might use as a graffiti writer to etch their name into a subway window or spray paint, which takes a little bit longer to remove. So there is a difference between, I think, a graffiti writer and a graffiti artist and a street artist who may also do work illegally or legally in the streets. You know, it's interesting because in, in talking to Assad, who's our graffiti instructor, you know, old school graffiti pioneer mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., for him, like one of the central pieces of being a graffiti writer is 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 public, mm -hmm. um, but it's also about identity. And, I, and, and listening to you just now is the first time it ever clicked for me that part of why people, or but you know, do you think that part of the reason why people don't like the tags is not just that it's the tag, is that it's someone else's identity who they don't know, so it doesn't have meaning for them, versus yeah. for that person that's painting their name all over the place, being able to be seen, have their name seen, but not necessarily understood or recognized that there's this kind of mystery, there's this kind of, it's, it's actually art for themselves in the public, as opposed yeah. to, Wheat paste usually is like a poster. It's usually kind of um, illustrations. It's it's things that are more recognizable, tolerable because it's not about the person who did it. It's actually about the message that's on it or the image that's on it. And what do you? How do you think that the fact that people who write their name every place, it's about part of the part of the disdain for it, is a, is about the fact that it is their name and not necessarily their ideas. Yeah. So so I, I have two thoughts coming out of that. Uh, one is that graffiti, and I should have said this earlier, like you said, is a person's name. It's the per it's the name that they've chosen to give themselves the nickname that they are writing all over. Oftentimes, street art is an image, so it might be a character, it might be a style. But like you're saying, there is a difference between seeing you know an image that's pasted in different locations rather than someone's tag that might be illegible to people outside of the graffiti community that look at it you know on their wall. Uh, oftentimes, the only people that can read tags are other graffiti writers and the police that are trying to catch those individuals. So it's a very small niche. And if you're you know, passing it day to day, it becomes kind of like the visual noise that you forget about. Um, if you pay attention, you look closely as someone who isn't in the graffiti community, then you start to see you know, the beauty in a tag. You know, I've got a tag behind me, I don't know which way to move, from Saber, who's in the MSK crew, which I've hung on my wall because I, I think there's just the way that he's written his signature is beautiful in itself compared to you know a piece that might take hours and hours. You know, there's there's beauty in all the different levels. Um, I also think it's incredibly important to note that tags are the are the groundwork of graffiti. If you don't have a good tag, oftentimes it doesn't matter if you're good when you do your throw up bubble letters or your pieces that are you know complicated, multicolored, take multiple hours to complete. The tag is the bedrock of graffiti writing. Um, I, and going back to how it might be shocking for someone to see that on their wall, um, it takes time, right? Tags can take anywhere from five to 30 seconds to do. Um, and if you go to bed and you have a clean wall of your apartment building and you wake up the next day and there's tags on it, that means someone was there. It means, you know, under, under the guise of night, somebody was able to sneak up, do their thing and get away with it. So there can be a kind of a shock there thinking about, you know, the intrusion of someone taking that public space oftentimes. Uh, many graffiti writers do have a, a code of things that they will write on, that they will not write on. Um, you know, there's a code within the graffiti community with respect with different graffiti writers. Um, but as someone who's removed from that group, these rules, the skill involved to do the artwork is often not recognized necessarily. 
I wonder though, how does someone like Retina complicate what we're talking about? Like when I look at Retina's work, it's it's oftentimes highly repetitious, stylized um, designs that are illegible. Right. Um, how, how does how does how does someone like him or his work complicate this idea that part of the disdain is is illegibility when his work is not necessarily legible either, but it's hugely popular. He's, he's one of the wealthiest street artists in the world with an estimated net worth of $5 million. So like, how does he complicate this discussion? Yeah, and, and I think, so there's always going to be a part of that conversation of quote unquote, like selling out, right? And taking your artwork away from the streets and putting it on canvases that can now be hung in someone's apartment or in their home. Um, and is it still graffiti or is it now graffiti art because you've taken away from that place where it grew up, where it really started. Um, for Retina, another artist who I'd consider a calligraphy artist because he is using a alphabet that he has created over you know, decades of hard work to create letters and which you know are, are then used to create phrases or sayings and whatnot that are, uh, to your point, illegible. Um, I, you know, but they are very graphic. They are very striking. And I think to the regular person passing by, it doesn't matter what it says, it matters what it looks like. Um, so, and I think that can also happen for tags. So I think location is, is somewhat matters. Uh, if you see something on a street versus a gallery, it can change um, the viewer's perception of the piece, which can then change um, you know, whether or not it's buffed and painted over and goes away, or whether it's bought for a couple you know, thousand dollars and hung in someone's home. Is it fair to say that most street art, and by most I mean like 51%, not like the overwhelming, mm -hmm. but most street art is political. So like I'm thinking about the Obey poster behind you. It mm -hmm. says Obey propaganda, um, but then it also says dissent. Yeah. Um, and I think about a lot of the wheat paste work that I see, even the stencils from um, folks like Banksy are still political in, in the fact that they leave room for interpretation and for for people to infer things by, by the work. I'm thinking also of folks like, um, um, why did I just go blank on his name? The, the street artist that was fairly famous in DC for a minute um, who got arrested. Borf. Borf. So yep. like Borf's work I think is inherently political, usually around like lifting up the voices of young people or people mm -hmm. that are unheard. So is, is street art almost always political in nature? So I would also argue that graffiti is inherently political in nature. Um, many, many graffiti writers are obviously putting their names and taking the time out of their day to put their artwork onto property that is not theirs. So there's something inherently, um, I don't know if anti-capitalist is the right word, but it's like making something that is a shared public space for everyone. Uh, I'm going out there, I'm putting my artwork into the world for free. And if people like it, that's great. And if not, they have the right to paint over it with you know regular buff paint or another artist has the democratic way of saying, you know what, I don't like that piece, I'm gonna paint over it myself. So I do think there's something inherently political with putting any type of artwork into the streets, whether that's graffiti or street art. Um, when you're talking about street artists specifically, I think you can do a lot more politically with street art because you're not focused, uh, or, or excuse me, most street artists are not focused on the name that they've chosen. So even though Shepard Ferry picked the name Obey, he had the Andre the Giant image to go along with it um, and then was able to build from there. Um, Banksy, it doesn't really matter that he has chosen the, the tag name Banksy, but it matters the images that he's then creating afterwards. So I, I do think that most street art has a political tinge to it, especially um, you know in different areas of the world. Uh, street art has been used to help uh, get political messages out in probably almost any country where it's performed. Um, I think about groups like the Gorilla Girls who are inherently political, creating posters and putting them outside of um, you know, galleries that are, that are inherently uh, disenfranchising or leaving out people of color and women artists while instead uh, you know, displaying artwork that has those uh, populations displayed. Um, I, I think about um, the Arab Spring and the use of stencils to get political messages across in various countries. Um, so yeah, I, I would think uh, street art has the ability to lend itself to be political and a lot of artists, it would be interesting to see if street artists were politically active before becoming street artists or use street art 
to convey their political beliefs and, uh, and you know one way or another. I think that makes a lot of sense because it, it's it's funny when I when I said political, I meant overtly. But you're mm-hmm. also saying that any art in the street that didn't get permission mm-hmm. is is inherently political. I, I would yeah, I, I would think so. So. Uh, this week, for example, in our class, we were talking about installation art. Um, and if you think about any sculpture that you often pass, especially in DC, right? If you go to a square or a park, there's a, oftentimes a sculpture. So that sculpture, you know, artists had to go back and forth with a committee and they had to go to the city and they had to get approval and they had a, a list of things that they could create or they couldn't create. There was a lot of steps that led to the approval of that public artwork being installed. Uh, if you pass by a corporate lobby of a giant skyscraper, maybe they'll have some artwork in it, but the public didn't choose that artwork. The corporation chose the artwork. They said, these are artists who are palatable, right? We're a multinational corporation and we wanna have this artist in our lobby. So when people walk in, you know, it doesn't offend anybody, and, you know, it, it, but it still says something, it's still artwork. We're still supporting artists. But as a street artist or as a graffiti writer, you're choosing to put whatever you want out there. And it's up to the streets and the community to say how long that piece of artwork is going to last. It was installed without permission and people don't need permission to paint over it or take it away. Uh, So we were learning about artists who do various types of artwork. Um, One group is the Graffiti Research Lab. They've done some incredible work in the early 2000s, uh, you know, creating, uh, using technology to make new forms of graffiti that were often less permanent than a marker or spray paint. So they made these things called LED throwies where they took a very inexpensive LED light, yeah, used electrical tape to put it to a battery and a magnet, and now it's just on. So it's a little light bulb that's automatically on until the battery runs out. And that, um, excuse me, it was a, the light was attached to the battery until the battery runs out. And then the magnet allowed them to throw those small light bulbs on anything that was magnetic. So they would take a metal, you know, the outside of a, a building and they throw thousands of these lights and turn this blank wall into essentially a galaxy of artwork. Um, they could take the little lights and put them in the eyes of a metal statue in a circle and it was glowing eyes. So, you know, even these off the wall kind of installations, they didn't get permission. So, um, you know, installation art, I think is a really good example of how you're going around the process of getting the permission. Um, but also people don't need permission to then take your artwork away or they can leave it up for a long time. Uh, you know, sometimes street art is done illegally and then the community loves it and they leave it there for years and years and years. I think about Banksy as an example, um, but other pieces where, uh, you know, you paint along the side of a railroad track and the graffiti community respects it and people don't paint over it for years and years and years. And it becomes, uh, almost like a historical marker in itself. So I have to unfortunately disagree with my expert on one thing, which sure. is you said that um, people don't need permission to take it away. And I would say yeah. that the, the lawsuit at Five Points says that that's not necessarily true. And, and for those that, for people that are not familiar, are you familiar enough with the case that you could talk about it? I wouldn't say familiar enough necessarily, but I'm familiar with Five Points. I you know, grew up visiting and gotcha. yeah. So um, a few years back, um, the people that own a a piece of property in New York City called Five Points um, decided they wanted to develop the space. The space had been a a place that they turned over to the graffiti community to basically do what Max was describing, which was to create and recreate and recreate um, and allow community standards and norms to determine what was there. But when they decided they wanted to sell it, they buffed the entire space without the permission of the artists. And those artists went and sued and won. Many of the artists who had work that was up, they got buffed, actually got a financial settlement because the state decided or the the courts decided that the the property owners actually didn't have the right to remove the art that the the artist had created in the space. And so this is kind of, and, and another example would be, I feel like Banksy has sued people who took, um, walls that he painted on in the UK where people literally came and cut out bricks that his artwork was on as a part of a building and put that section of a wall on auction. So this is something that he created for the public that um, a private person decided that they could buy and sell. Um, I feel like he sued the people that did that. So there's all these, so I'm just saying the, the disagreement is that um, it's not just, it's, it's changing that people mm-hmm. do need permission to remove things, even if they were put there illegally. 
What do you uh, think? So I think there are some cities where if a graffiti writer has illegally put their artwork on your wall, you can be fined by the city for not removing it within a certain amount of time. So that person can't go to the person, uh, the, the property owner can't go to the individual who's anonymous who graffiti their wall and say, hey, is it okay if I paint over the thing that you did on my wall? Um, secondly, I'm of the opinion, and I love obviously that the five points decision turned out in favor of the artists, but I do believe, at least with my own artwork, that if I am putting it into the community without permission, that they do not not need permission to um, remove it. Um, much like a book, I think that once the author is finished with their book and it's in the hands of the audience, the audience owns the interpretation of the work to a certain extent. Um, you know, they can imagine what happens to the character afterwards and build those stories in their own mind. And with my artwork, when I put it out into the streets, once I've walked away from it, it is no longer mine necessarily. Um, at least in my own opinion. Um, is, so, is it, so it's a little different. Is it fair that, so real quick, so Paul wanted to say, um, what's cool about NYC graffiti inspired art is that an artist will write uh, one name for their entire life. And that's true for, for most, for many artists in lots of different places. I know that like in listening to Asad, um, our graffiti instructor, he talks about having gone through three different names. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you, do you what, what's your name? Or what so, do you I've had two names, um, and I currently write a certain name, but I don't know if I necessarily want to say it on the recording. Who's the fans after you? Come on, man! It's like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I was so so. If you're not going to share that here, can I say this? Sure. I was asking, is it fair for you to say that? Because a lot of times, the work that you do in the streets is literally turning someone's trash into treasure. Like you're literally creating on and things that people usually are disposing it's highly temporary because it's going to be picked up so is it fair for you to to kind of come well actually no so how would you feel if someone took one of those things that you left in the streets and put it up for auction um so so great so um i do that under my my legal name so i do that under max gibbons lettering um i also think that it is not necessarily illegal to do graffiti on discarded objects uh, and i wouldn't even call it graffiti at that point i would call it street art um, because these objects are being discarded by their owner and they'll be thrown out and go to the dump within usually hours or days of that person putting it on the curb. Uh, so what Mazi is saying, um, I, I walk around with markers and spray paint and I will create artwork out of the literal trash that's being disposed of. If there's a TV, I'll write phrases on it. If there's a headboard, I'll you know do calligraphy on it. Um, and, and there was one time actually where I, I did a piece and I walked around the block and I did a couple others. And when I came back around, the piece was gone. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I took another picture of the location to kind of get a before and after. And as I was doing that, someone came up on a bike and was like, hey, like, are you taking a picture of the garbage? My daughter just took that piece and she's gonna go hang it in her room. And I was so happy, uh, totally shocked um, that this mirror that I had painted on was going to get thrown out. Now that I had written across it in paint marker, it was gonna go hang up in someone's apartment. Um, to your question, if someone took that piece and then tried to sell it, um, I don't, it, it's hard. I, I don't think I'd be upset. I hope that I would still get the credit as the artist. And then that sale would funnel interest into my artwork that people could buy directly from me. But since I had given that to the streets and for someone to take away, I wouldn't actually be upset. I know that might not be what a lot of artists would say, but uh, you know, the second that I am done creating the artwork, I don't necessarily care what happens to it. And that goes for my murals. Um, you know, if I do a mural and someone who does graffiti illegally, if a bomber comes and says, I want to take that wall, they can do that. And I will not be upset. I was giving you the people's eyebrow because like, I know. <laughs> if someone took one of your pieces that, that, that is that, dis that disposable art and sold it for $100,000 and you did all the labor, I'm pretty sure you would feel so. You, you, I don't think you would just want credit. Really? I, I would. I would be. I, I would hope that there would then be interest in my art that people could also buy directly from the artist. Yeah. Because then, because then there's because that means then that my artwork is worth a hundred thousand dollars, right? That means there's a market for it. So now I don't have to just give. I mean, I'll still hopefully give it to the streets, but now there's a market and the artwork would be in demand, right? It's funny. There's this. There's this phrase that's become popular in a in a much more misogynistic context right now. That's like, 
it, they it says she belongs to the streets. So you're saying that your art it belongs to the streets. I I think so, and I and I think there is you know there's nothing more pure from than someone illegally doing artwork in the streets where they get no monetary benefit. There is a risk of them being arrested or beat up by somebody else or hurt or falling off a bridge. Um, and and I think that art in the streets is incredibly important. And uh, with mine, it's 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 less illegal because it's on art, you know, it's on it's on trash. Um, so it's there's a less risk involved for me. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say so. So here's a question. Uh, someone just asked me this very recently. They asked, um, when we started Words, Beats, and Life, was it controversial? Mm. We were teaching uh, young people art forms that are connected to hip hop. And so in your case, uh, I'd ask the question, how often do people ask you about why you're teaching people to do something that is inherently, in most cases, illegal. Yeah. Um, so I do get that question. And I think even some of the students will ask that question in class. They, they're interested in this art form, whether it's graffiti or street art. They see it around and they want to be involved, but maybe they don't want to get arrested, right? Maybe they don't want to take that risk and put their artwork out into the public. Um, and I think one argument would be the skills and, and the learning that you're developing in these classes does not have to be used to create a legal artwork. You could use it for graphic design. You could find legal walls to paint uh, in your community. You could paint your own walls. Um, you could build a portfolio out of the legal artwork that you're creating that looks like street art or looks like graffiti. Um, you can also use the color theory that you're learning or the design-based learning that you're, you're doing of how to create a cohesive piece to create graphic design. Uh, you could use it to go into marketing. You could use it to go into uh, learning Photoshop and working for a company. If you could go into you know a studio practice and just being an artist who does studio work legally, obviously, and and making art that way. So I think that it doesn't have to be tied necessarily to creating illicit or illegal uh, work in the streets. It can be, but I don't, of course, encourage any of my students to do any of the illegal artwork. But if they do, um, you know, if that is their choice, and I think there are lots and lots of artists, many of whom we've talked about today who have started in illegal artwork, uh, you know, putting their artwork in the streets without permission, that have gone on then to having a legitimate studio practice, Retina, Banksy, Revoke, um, uh, Keith Haring, Basquiat, I mean, you name it, the list goes on and on. Max, have you, have you had an opportunity to be able to travel abroad, particularly to places, uh, countries in Europe specifically? I have. So what do you think about um, what at least appears to me as a tourist as quasi legal graffiti that covers cities like do you think if if you had your druthers would would street art and graffiti art be like all drugs in some countries in the United States where it's a hundred percent legal it's decriminalized but then it also means it's everywhere would if you could would you make it so that America would look a lot more like Europe in that sense where graffiti is everywhere, street art is everywhere. Uh, two things come to mind automatically. One is um, there's, a, there's a common like mantra within the community that I've heard. It's like art is not a crime, right? So, so art should not be legal. So, so that's one part. Uh, two is when people post pictures of graffiti, often the direct first comment is, how would you feel if somebody did this on your house? I would be stoked. I would love if somebody came and painted an awesome piece or even just did a bunch of tags on my wall or on my property. Um, my whole neighborhood here in Brooklyn, for example, lots of graffiti, lots of street art, both legal and illegal, so permission walls and not. And I love seeing everything. I walk around and I will respect the smallest tag compared to the biggest mural. Um, so to answer your question, uh, yes, I think that graffiti should at least be decriminalized. I think that um, if there is a requirement for police to be active in a community, then I do not think that graffiti should be their number one priority. I think the concept of a vandal squad is sometimes often ridiculous. There are so many more destructive crimes, both to people and property that are not graffiti related, um, that are not you know, putting paint onto a surface. Um, also graffiti has been around in the form that we would consider it to be, um, style writing, rap letters, whatever you wanna call it, uh, for almost 50 or 60 years at this point. I don't think it's going away. I think it changes, obviously, because of a vast majority of things, whether it's social media, uh, the rise of uh, surveillance on the streets and, and the risks involved with doing illegal graffiti. Um, but I don't think it's going anywhere. And I do think that 
in Europe, they have it more, um, more thought out where they understand that, you know, graffiti can bring uh, artwork to a community. You know, people can do street art tours. They can learn about the artists who inhibit, uh, who live in those communities. Um, so yeah, I, I think my, my absolute answer, 100%, uh, make it more accessible, make it less illegal. Um, there are cases where graffiti writers are getting stronger or, or more harsh sentences than murderers or people who have done terrible, terrible things. And I think that just shows an injustice within the legal system. I wonder, as, as I, we're getting towards the end of this interview, but I wonder, is it possible that, that maybe the, the disdain for graffiti is not just about permission, but that it's about uncompensated work? And as a society, like as a, as a capitalist nation, we value things less that people don't get paid for. That's an interesting take, and I haven't necessarily thought about it within that context. Um, so I, do, I don't know if I have an answer necessarily. I, th I think it's scary for a lot of people, right? They don't know why someone's doing it. They also don't know why it says what it says. And I don't think that the individual who critiques it doesn't think, you know what, I could do that too. I have just as much right or just as much freedom as the person who put that there to do the same thing, yeah. I'm asking in part because I'm thinking to myself, like corporations put up their graffiti as we paste Mm -hmm. uh, all over communities and people generally don't say, why is that corporation advertising in my neighborhood? Why are they yeah. putting their name up every place? And part of the reason why they don't is because corporations paid for that space. Mm -hmm. This idea that people not only got permission, but that they also paid for it. So, and the property owner was paid to have it there. So really quickly, oftentimes a lot of those billboards are not supposed to be there, which is an entirely different argument, right? So those are illegally placed billboards where the corporation is fined by the city or the municipality or whatever it might be, but the amount of money that they're being fined for putting up an illegal advertisement comparably doesn't matter. They're making you know millions and millions off of selling that product. So they're actually doing the same thing that graffiti writers are doing, but they've got the piggy bank to back it up. They've got the lawyers who can support them. They have the ability to put their advertisements in places where they're legally not supposed to and get away with it. Um, you know, I think about ad busting or um, uh, brandalism or something along those lines where you're taking an image and, and changing it to make it yours. That could be painting over a billboard that already exists with your own artwork. It could be taking the advertisement out of a bus shelter, modifying it and putting it back. So I do think there is something and a lot of this gets to something we we're talking about earlier, where some of the art is anti-capitalist or or political in nature. Um, but there is, I, I tell my students a lot, uh, uh, graffiti writing and street art is democratizing. It's it's you you're, it's the most form of putting your message out there, and and you're and you're able to say what you want to, and people can put it away or take it away um, or leave it up, like I was saying earlier. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with what you're saying, Mazi. So I'm curious, let's talk in this last 15 minutes about the experience you're having teaching during COVID. I know that uh, before when you lived in DC, you were here, nope. you were here in Washington, DC, teaching here at our headquarters. And um, that was one experience that we have all the photos with students at the little circular tables and their sketchbooks, being able to paint and draw and even using our practice wall outside. Mm -hmm. Now doing this thing virtually, um, especially do a kind of surveillance technology of the, the cameras on students' computers. What kind of experience are you having as a, as a teacher in a virtual space? Sure, so one of the approaches that I took when teaching virtually is a lot of the class is actually more about exposing the students to different types of street art or different types of street artists, and then giving them the, the opportunity or, or the, uh, the tools and the techniques to then create artwork inspired by or informed by that. So a lot of these students, um, you know, maybe they're interested in street art that they've seen, but they've only seen things like stickers or wheat paste, you know, things that traditionally are street art. Maybe they haven't seen yarn bombing, for example, which is using yarn or crochet to then cover something, you know, with that material. So taking a lamppost that is usually, uh, you know, just metal with a light on top, you know, putting a crocheted scarf essentially all the way up it. Um, so there's all different ways to create street art and to create art in the streets. So a lot of the classes have been more informational around that and then taking class time to then start to think through the way that they would take that technique or take that learning and then create their own artwork. Um, for example, this week we were learning about the street artist Invader 
who makes artwork with mosaic tiles. So then we went online and we found a resource where you essentially make pixelated images. So each pixel could represent a tile and the students were making digital artworks that then if they wanted to, could use that as the blueprint to make a physical artwork actually in the world. And one of the major challenges that schools are having is doing things like getting students to turn on their cameras, yeah. getting them to engage, getting them to participate um, more broadly. Are you finding similar or different? Um, are you having similar or different experiences teaching them something that is a class that maybe they signed up for? Like one of the, before you answer, one of the things I often say, particularly for students in DC public schools, they're, they're basically like four art classes that most young people will have at some point, which are um, pottery, um, watercolors, choir, and band. It's mm -hmm. like kind of fundamental experience that almost everyone who goes through the DC public school system has. And so when we introduce them to graffiti or street art or fine art, um, they haven't usually had exposure to, to these forms. They might be interested in them and working independently. So are you finding that you're getting a different level of engagement than many teachers are complaining about getting? Um, so I haven't heard the experiences of other teachers. I do think that this is a very visual yeah. medium. Oh, sorry. In, in terms of schools, not not, necessarily, ah. not in the academy. But sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. For, yep. Thanks for the clarification. Um, so there is still some challenges with students turning on their cameras um, while I'm presenting or while we're talking. But the second I say, does anybody have any artwork to show? They turn on their cameras and they show me the artwork and they're super pumped, whether it's their sketchbook or a piece of loose leaf or whatever that might be. And then maybe they turn it off again. Um, I had an experience this week in one of my classes where we were doing activity. Usually we try to level set at the beginning of class, especially with everything that's been going on in the past couple of weeks uh, in the news and everything that's going on. Um, and, and we do a rose thorn bud, you know, where you say your rose for the week, which is something that was great. The thorn, which is something that maybe isn't so great. It's kind of poking you in the side and the bud, which is the growth, the, the, the hope, you know, whatever the next thing might be. And one of the students said, you know, the thorn is, I don't really love the online learning. You know, it's, it's really challenging. I'm doing okay in school, but you know, being virtually taught is very difficult. And then I asked like, you know, how's this going? Like, oh, but I love this, you know, this is totally fine. So I think like you were saying that the, the subject matter also makes a difference. And a lot of these students took it upon themselves to sign up for these classes. So even though it is virtual learning, they took the initiative to take that first step and be interested and to come back week after week for this 10 week session at least. Uh, so I think you know, you know, trying to make that time valuable for these students is incredibly important because they've already taken the biggest step, which is taking on more virtual learning you know, during a time when they're already having to do that for regular school. I wonder, so, you know, I wonder how much of this is kind of like, you know, in creating the academy, I wanted to create what was my college experience where mm -hmm. I opened up this giant course manual and looked at all the different classes and picked what I wanted to learn. And I don't think that that's most people's experience in K through 12 education. It's always prescribed learning mm -hmm. with the exception of maybe electives, which are usually things like gym or band or whatever. But even in those cases, they're not connecting gym to a career or to something you can do outside of school. That I feel like that is the major failure of American education is that it doesn't help young people understand the relationship between what they're learning and what they want to learn. Slash, it doesn't create necessarily, in most cases, um, a path to learning what you want. And so like part of my own story is I didn't want to go to college because I thought college was like high school, except you got to pay for it and you have to live there. Like who wants to live? Mm -hmm in high school and have to learn about it. But then when I learned that college is this totally other thing that I would not have known had I not already been accepted to the university. Like if I had just gone on what I knew from my, my previous educational experience, there's no way I would have signed up for that. And so I feel like part of what we're trying to do is give them a taste of what college is like before, while they're still in elementary, middle, high school. I think it's amazing. And I, and I actually have not heard you describe it that way, Mazi, before, but I, I think what you just said is incredibly important. And it is indicative of what Words Based in Life allows students to do. And maybe this is the first time in their life where they're able to choose to go to a class, an educational platform, whether it's virtual or in person, eventually, uh, again, uh, you know, what that subject matter is. So I think that's, that's great. Um, I think about being in school myself, you know, or hearing students say, you know, in a class, whether it's math or social studies or whatever it might be, you know, when am I actually gonna use this? 
And for here, you know, for let's just say the, the B-boy class, for example, they're learning how to do those skills where it could lead to a job. Same thing with the street art class. They're learning this entire art form or history or techniques or whatever, and then learning about, it could either be a hobby, it could be a, you know, something they do as a side hustle, it could be something that turns into a full-time career. It's a great point. Um, I don't know if we talked before we came on about sharing whether it's your art or art that you share with the students, do, are you actually prepared to share anything with our viewers? Uh, sure. So I do have uh, my sketchbook, one of many here. Uh, this is a sketchbook that I keep with me specifically for the calligraffiti work. Um, this way I can show a business owner or somebody who goes to that, here, here's a book of designs. Let me know if one of these stands out and maybe you can you know, put it on your wall, right? So the first thing that I have in the book, um, oh gosh, is pictures of my murals. So that way I don't have to pull up Instagram or send them there. So I actually have printed photographs of some examples that go, oh, now I see what it looks like on a wall. Uh, I have some graffiti lettering, if they're interested in that, obviously. And then I have sample alphabets, right? So I've got all these different things. And I have, if you let me uh, move a little bit, uh, you know, pictures of murals that I've painted and then designs gridded out. So if they're interested in anything like this, they can see, you know, this, could look like this on your wall. So I think that's one way, uh, you know, you process pictures, this is what it's gonna look like, that's the end result, and then like sketches for future ones that I could do. Um, you know, all those different types of designs and patterns and and showing that, you know, I, 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 I have a, you know, various amount of letters or alphabets or things that I can put onto their wall if they ask. Um, I'm looking back to some of the murals and pieces that I've done over the summer. Um, you know, things that we were doing uh, in, in June over the summer uh, here in New York City. Um, different sketching, obviously, of just basic lettering structures um, that then turned into murals that were actually put on the street, which was pretty great. Um, so yeah, so just the sketchbook there. Um, I've also got, and I can, I think I can share my screen and forgive me for uh, sharing a, um, a, a Google uh, Chrome window. Um, but let's see, share screen, uh, entire screen. Okay, so let me know, you'll probably see me. Can you see my screen right now, Mozzie? Yep, right there. Great, okay, so these are just various murals that I keep in like a Google Drive folder, um, so I can send them to people or share them links. Um, I'll start with not, not too many, but I'll open this one. This is in a skate park. Uh, that was pretty fun. Uh, I used metallic paint, and then I did the name of the skate park in these circles here, which was a lot of fun. Um, this was one of my first murals that I actually did in Washington, D.C. That was in, um, in Words of Ethan Life helped put this all together, but it was the center mural piece. Oh, go ahead. In uh, Story Park. Yep, in Story Park. Is there a building on top of this now? There is. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. So maybe this this piece still exists you know, under a couple thousand tons of concrete and metal. Um, and, and yeah, there's lots of art that went around that. Uh, different designs. This was a mural that we did with Words, Beats, and Life a couple of years ago for um, Rumi Nations. Uh, yeah. Mazi, do you want to talk about this piece? No, no, no. I was just going to say it. I forgot the name. You're good. Oh, okay. Yep. So this was on the side of um, the Fridge, which is a art gallery in Washington, D.C. that hosts lots of street art and graffiti. Uh, and this was also then painted. There was another mural by an artist named Dem Dema uh, from the crew C and N uh, on the side. These are a couple other murals. The uh, neon effect is inspired by a graffiti artist from New York named Adams, uh, Adam Fu on Instagram. So I was playing around with that technique. A couple of people liked that. So I actually painted this in a, in a backyard of uh, some folks here in Brooklyn. Um, so this is just a, a cool piece that I painted, uh, oh my gosh, I guess a year and a half ago now. So 2019. Um, and then you know various other murals and just ways that lettering works. Uh, this is some of the pieces that I painted, uh, semi-permission pieces over the summer. Um, so uh, <laughs> went down to Soho uh, in June after everything had happened uh, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, and and a lot of the artists were going and kind of reclaiming these spaces where buildings and you know these multi-million-dollar corporations were putting you know plywood up, uh, which then kind of led to these uh, blank canvases for artists to come across. 
So this is a pretty big piece that I painted. It wasn't there for very long. Once again, street art and graffiti is very ephemeral, doesn't last forever. Uh, so I was painting these pretty quickly as well. So I wouldn't uh, have to deal with anything. Uh, here's a couple of photos. These are names of people who have been victims of police violence. Um, the say their names and that American flag wheat paste were already on this wall. And then I actually put my artwork around this. Um, I didn't sign these pieces and I didn't promote them on my Instagram either. This is actually the first time that I'm showing people and I didn't mean to necessarily Mozzie. It's just they're in this album. Um, I felt like I didn't want to get any social media attention or profit or anything off of the injustices that so many people have faced in the face of uh, police violence. So um, these pieces didn't last very long and I didn't sign them or anything. Um, to, to what Mazi was speaking about earlier, the calligraphy that I do on discarded objects, I only have a couple images here, but I just do graffiti lettering or this, this calligraphy lettering um, on things that are being thrown out. So here's a TV that are damaged goods on. I usually have like listening to a podcast or listening to music and I'll put the words onto these items or I have a note in my phone of fun things that might look good on things. So here's a washing machine. Uh, and <laughs> glad I got a little laugh in my mind. And here's a, a, a freezer and a, a refrigerator. So uh, yeah, so that's just a little sample of some of the work that I've done. Um, and I believe I've stopped sharing my screen. So you did. great. Um, as we get ready to wrap up, I wonder um, your choice to come back to teach during COVID. Uh, first off, we really appreciate it. You're one of my favorite instructors for the academy for a whole range of reasons, including the preparation that you put into to a lesson that you really take it seriously, the responsibility of being able to hand down tradition and history and helping young people see a world bigger than the one they've, they've visited. Um, I wonder if there was one thing um, that you hoped that the work that you're doing as an independent artist, but also as an educator or, or a teaching artist, what's the, what a, what's the one or you know, the big, hairy, audacious goal that drives you to continue to, to pass down tradition and history? Um, sure. Graffiti, calligraphy, street art, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think it just goes back to the each one to each one kind of mindset where these communities are so built on the experience of those who have come before you. I don't think it's always great to, to look to somebody else to, to be inspired by or learn necessarily, but to have that person who can give you a little bit of insight and kind of show you the ropes or tell you, eh, don't paint over that or do this, or this is the way that you can create a mural or hold the pen a certain way or use this type of cap to get a certain line when you're doing your mural is incredibly important. Uh, so, you know, for any artist who has either had the opportunity to learn from others or didn't and wished that they had, if they then can fill that need for a younger artist or someone who's just learning or getting started, I think it's incredibly important whether you are a teaching artist or whether you're just someone out in the world interacting with others. Um, when I was asked to come back, I was extremely happy. Uh, being in New York and not being physically in Washington, DC uh, is, is obviously challenging if there are in-person classes uh, and being you know, physically removed from the Words, Beats, and Life office and the, and the legal practice wall that WBL has for students to practice graffiti and street art. But that's one of the, I guess, silver linings if there are any of COVID is that a lot of people have turned to virtual means of learning and that virtual communication and, and um, coming together. So I've been able to interact with students and some of them aren't in DC either. Some of them are across the country or in different time zones, but we're all able to connect and still have that learning environment. No doubt. Yeah. I wanna thank you for making time for this conversation, uh, for continuing to do the important work you're doing as an independent artist. Um, I know that this is not your full-time job, but it's definitely a full-time passion. It is. Appreciate you being able to share that with, with the next generation of visual artists here in DC and beyond. Thanks, Mazi. Yeah, this was great. Um, if anybody wants to ask me any questions, uh, you know, I'm available always. I love talking about graffiti and street art. You can find me on Instagram, Max Gibbons Lettering. Uh, or if you have a youth, uh, you know, a student who's interested, you know, join our class. We're around. There's some incredible courses, whether it's mine or, or somebody else at Words Beast Life. So no doubt. So thanks so much, Max, for joining us. Thank you, viewers, for, for enjoying. We're actually getting ready to launch summer programming uh, this, chill, this June. Applications become available on uh, April the 1st, and we're looking to enroll students for hybrid programming, some in person, some virtual. 
So looking forward to seeing you. Once again, Max Gibbons, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Mazi Mutafa, Executive Director of Words Beats and Life. I'm out. <laughs>